This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 170 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Finish Line Fencing, the original and only warranted horse fence of its kind. Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have some geniuses. They really are. They really figured this whole thing out. Dr. Juliet Getty joins us again, and she's going to talk about winterizing our horses. And we've got a beautiful couple, a really heartwarming story coming out of Arizona. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I couldn't do it without my producer, who's here with me today. Hi, Jen. Aw, I feel needed. I like that. I like to feel oh, needed. Oh, I'm yes. telling you, you are needed. Yes. It's absolutely true. If anybody, well, it would be silence without you. <laughs> That's what it would be. Absolutely, absolutely nothing. silence. Yeah. Well, yeah. As, as we record this little bit of our episode today, you guys out there at Flags Up Farms... Oh. is are finishing up the transitional horses clinic oh. that you did. And in my personal opinion, groundbreaking quantum oh. shift in how people who are in charge of finding homes for transitional horses find the homes and how people who are about to bring in a transitional horse do it. So give us kind of the, the quick and dirty overview of what it was and how it went. It was so fun. That's the quickest one. And it was so much fun. We call it the Monty Roberts Mustang and, and Transition Horse Program. It is generously funded right now as a pilot program of the Right Horse Initiative, which is a program of the ASPCA. Yep, we've been brainstorming on this on, for a few years. We're just a little slow, but we finally we finally pulled it all together with some really wonderful people. And the idea is that, you know, we don't have to say rescue horses anymore. We don't even have to say rescue dogs and cats, but we know it's acceptable in the dogs and cats world. In horses, it kind of gives this connotation that you're going to throw them in the back pasture, sanctuary like. They're, they're you know, they're done. And they're not. These are beautiful, they're off the track thoroughbreds. We have an unstarted saddlebred horse. We have a, an appendix paint horse named Mariposa that has a butterfly mark on her shoulder that's just unbelievable that it came out like perfect. And, you know, it's just these really cool horses that are looking for their next home and their next vocation. And they're athletic. We got a, a war horse in there. I mean, it, she, he won a court. He's so pretty. He's, <laughs> he is cool. He's gray. He's nine. And he is built like a tank. He won a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. And I know just an unbelievable amount of races. He's just, and he's the quietest, gentlest. I mean, Everybody wants him, unfortunately. That's the sad part. And then we've got, you know, we've got some other OTDBs that are just started. So they're three, four. And then we've got a six-year-old, again, won a bunch, of, raced in Dubai, won a bunch of money, is sound and solid. So and what, oh what, you had a whole bunch of horses that came in. Yeah. What happened after that? A whole bunch of horses came to flag us up farms. Uh, what was, we had what was the format? So the format was... Hey, if we're going to do this and do this as a pilot program, the barrier to entry in adoption is often the training. Everybody knows that you can get the horses from here to there and transportation is sometimes a challenge, but really it's not. It's the training. You know, the people that want a horse need to know it's a reliable horse. And, you know, I'm Monty Roberts, the name Monty Roberts and training go hand in hand. And so what we decided to do was put this pilot together and then it's COVID time, right? And Horse and Country TV did this beautiful job of live streaming our, the movement. It's just our event that we have in the spring. And they are excited about having live streaming content. There's a really smart man named David Qualls who has started really he's like the ESPN of horses he does all the live streaming all across the United States and we and David came to do the movement last June and we just loved him so much we said if you want to do anything else well what's natural this was natural. So on Monday morning last, we started the cameras rolling, live streaming on Horse and Country TV. And of course, dad, who works without a net, he's, you know, doesn't have a 
drop of adrenaline in his body, he just uh, started working with these horses one after another, never having met them, you know, just taking them at face value. What is this horse? Oh, he's been ridden. Okay. All right. We'll go from there. And, oh, this horse has never seen a saddle. Okay. We'll go from there. And one after another, we worked with these nine horses in various training routines. We did a morning session and an afternoon session and it was a marathon and we all were so inspired. So that is the Monty Roberts Mustang and Transition Horse Program. We will open up for adoption here almost any time. So what we did, I don't know, Jen, if you remember, but we have a thing called the six imperatives of for a horse to be reasonable to train and ride. Mm -hmm. And the six are imperatives are basically a horse will stand still. It will turn left. It will turn right. It will back up. It will go forward, you know, and come to the mounting block. So those with those six imperatives, we thought, okay, everybody's got to have those little check the boxes before they leave. Mm -hmm. And that means if they've just had their first saddle and rider on, it might take a little bit longer than the war horse that's, you know, won Mm -hmm. 29 races. So Salty, Name his registered name is it uh, unlikely taste or something like this, and he's gray, so of course he's salty I around think here. Fabulous, perfect, right? It's just absolutely perfect. So yeah, he's going to be good to go here in uh, probably early next week. So people should go to montyroberts.com forward slash adopt and read all about the program and the amazing people that are associated with it. It's Christy Capper, we call her Tex. She's down in Texas and she is the program manager for the Right Horse. And uh, of course, Emily Weiss is um, the head of the equestrian or equine division of the ASPCA. These are real horse gals and real businesswomen too. And they have a passion for the adoption and transition horses. And then, oh my gosh, if I get started, all the names that are involved in this. Jamie Jennings is, you know, host. She was out there too, yeah. She was out here and she's she believes in the program. She is at the program because she's also doing this with with Horse and Hound in Oklahoma, where she's, I think they increased adoptions from 30 a year, approximately, to about 80 plus in this last year. So it really is It's going to be a quantum shift Mm -hmm. as different groups and organizations who are working to find homes start Mm -hmm. to embrace this. And for me personally, it's just as exciting that people who want to bring a transitional horse into their life Mm -hmm. they can also benefit from it because the horse has to have those six imperatives, but so does the human. Yes, exactly. And we we often don't know where to start. Yeah. The next time, the next time we record together, I want to have six imperatives for the human. Okay. (laughs) Because I think, I think we miss that. That's just good one. Because just like you can, you can untrain the best training in the world if you're uh, not a good human. That is so true, Coach Jen. You've know. seen it from <laughs> I've first, seen it. First, I've yeah. seen it. So there we go. Well, that is so I, fabulous. We could go on and on and on and on and on about it. And I'm I suspect as time goes on, we'll hear more about the next uh, clinic that you guys are going to have, and maybe we'll get some stories about horses who were adopted out of this first clinic. Yes. But in the meantime, we're running short on time, so we need to hear from our fabulous sponsors, Finish Line Fencing. Hear all about what's going on there. They make the only warranted fencing, fencing of its kind in the world. So yeah. listen carefully. And then when we come back, we're going to get to our first guest. Yay. Well, I'm here again with Kim and Lisa, and we're talking about finish line fencing because I get a lot of questions from people who are trying to put up one thing or another, and they know now about finish line fence and your product. But here's some of the questions that I get, or at least one biggie. What's the difference between finish line fencing, the one, the original and finish line XL? Yeah, absolutely, Debbie. Like I mentioned before, the original finish line has actually been out for over 30 years now. And that one was actually developed for horse safety. It's it's 1,250 pounds of tensile strength. It's four millimeters in diameter. And it's available on a spool. And one spool only weighs about 24 pounds. So it's very lightweight and easy to handle. XL, on the other hand, has been out for a few years now. It is 1,850 pounds of tensile strength, five millimeters in diameter. And it, it really just adds to the visibility, that, that thicker diameter to it. So is that, that's the main feature of that is so that you can see it a little bit more from a distance aesthetically or uh, visibility for the animals? Yes, that, that's, that was one of the main reasons. And actually, it was an answer. We came up with this because a lot of our customers keep their cattle and the horses together. 
So we right. needed to come up with a solution for them. So we needed something a little higher tensile strength. So by increasing the diameter, which gave you the beautiful line to look at and more visibility, it mm -hmm. also gave you that added tensile strength. So that way the horses and cattle, when they were worried about not maybe it not being strong enough at 1250, the original. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, we came out with this and it's actually very popular, still very economical and it's really in high demand right now. I'll put it this way, 30 years ago, we used to sell about 1% black. Huh. Now it's about 3% black. And I think it's more of a trend in in style. You know, if you've got both colors available, they should counsel with you on what's going to be the best look and the best safety for their horses for their particular region. I imagine green backgrounds versus sandy Arizona backgrounds, you know, might make the difference. Thanks for sharing all that too. So where do people find you? How do they get hold of you? So there are a few different ways that you can reach us. Um, we do have a website. It's finishlinefence.com. Our Facebook page is Finish Line Fence, or you can give us a call at 877-625-6100. You can order online. We have a full shop on our website. You can give us a call. We'd be happy to get you a quote for free. I and mean, we do ship out daily and worldwide as well. We're, we're very quick on shipping. We usually ship out the same day, if not the next business day. Christopher and Amanda Moore founded Raining Grace Ranch in 2009, and together they have over 20 years of experience working with children, teenagers, and horses. Christopher and Amanda met when they were just 12 years old. That doesn't happen anymore. Both traveled the country as professional competitive dancers, and they became dance partners, and then true friendship blossomed. The rest is history. Well, welcome. I've got Amanda and Chris, Christopher, more on the phone, and they're from Raining Grace Ranch, and I'm really excited. We have been planning this for, for about a month and a half, I think, to get you on, and I know how busy you are, and no wonder if people go to your website, and we'll give them that to, to write down later on, too, but I love your motto, Where Redemption Runs Free, and I love your story, but before we get into Raining Grace Ranch, which is the, the reason for the being here on this podcast, I'd like to know a little bit about you two, because it's interesting to me how not only a person makes a decision to dedicate their life to something like this, which is serving, frankly, uh, but how a couple does it and how that mm -hmm. came, came to be. So Amanda, I'd love to start with you. We got to chat a little bit. We were introduced by friends of ours, Kim at uh, Finish Line Fencing, and I, I just, I love their team, and I'm really glad she introduced us, and I feel like I know you, even though we haven't met. Wow. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you two came to the decision that you're going to change change your lives a little bit. Yeah. So so about, about 11 years ago, Christopher and I were struggling in our marriage, and we had actually grown up together dancing. So we had something that we had in common and something that we, you know, a common goal we worked together for achievement, that type of thing and stopped dancing, got married, started our careers. And we found that we were growing apart and we both had a love for horses. I had horses growing up and he had horses growing up, but we just never could afford them. But it came to a point in our marriage that Christopher it was actually Christopher's idea said, Hey, we need to, we need to have something that we do in common together that, that we can love together. And so we got into a point where we could afford to buy two horses. And, and so we, we decided to, we bought two Tennessee walking horses from Texas actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's how it, how it all started. It, you know, it was one of those things where we, we just needed to have something that we shared together because I think, too often marriages start drifting apart because they don't share some of the same passions together and they don't share, you know, just, just what to look forward to the next day. And mm -hmm. it was really kind of a cool experience because it, as much as it was a together thing that we did, it was very much individual because I started to pay attention to what the horse was telling me, you know, as a kid, I had horses, but never, they were, they're more of a, honestly, they were my mom's show horses and they were a lot of burden for me. So I really didn't pay attention a whole lot to them until this, this next phase of my life, I started recognizing, you know, if I would come out to the barn in a bad mood because Christopher and I had been fighting, mm -hmm. my mare wanted nothing to do with me. Really? Yeah. So, 
yeah, so that started us on this journey of common language and common interest and, and it, quite honestly, horses saved our marriage. That's nice. Good grief. That is a, a huge statement, but you know, I bet there's a lot of people out there that don't act on that. So cool that you picked it up. And Christopher, what a great, what a great thing that you thought of. Why horses? Why Christopher? Did you think that that would be the, the approach yeah. that you would take? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I think in, in some ways it was totally a God thing. If, if this were, and I'm not really a sporto kind of guy, but I would call this a Hail Mary pass because I really thought our marriage was done. In fact, you know, sometimes talking about it, Amanda might laugh at me because I get really emotional about it because I knew okay. that um, I was the reason why it was falling apart. I was so focused on building our, our company that I'd forgotten about my partner. And so, you know, going to bed at night was like, you know, we didn't, you know, Amanda and I were dance partners. That's how we met really young. We, we danced competitively. We were on Hee Haw. So we had done that very well together. So we were tight. You know, we would lift and throw each other. I'd lift and throw her in the air and she knew that I was going to catch her. We had that kind of relationship. Right. But we grew up in this business that we had started and uh, she was running the company with me and we'd go to bed at night and, you know, it was no longer, I love you. And I'd give her a kiss. It was, how are we doing with receivables? Yeah. And, you know, Aww. it would turn into conversations conversations that weren't weren't friendly. So mm. honestly I thought I just about killed it. The reason why I picked the horses was, you know, it just it just popped into my head that it was something that I remember doing that I enjoyed doing. And I knew that she loved animals and I thought this is something we could do together, but we'd also have a little bit of space. Mm-hmm. So that, a lot of, that was a lot of work, we a way. lot of work. I mean, that's a, you know, that was going to make or break. I imagine. right? <laughs> I had no idea what we were getting into, but I will tell you that it was an opportunity for me to figure out how to really become closer to my wife and love what she loved. As much as I loved horses, horses for me as a kid um, were a tool. You know, I was, I was raised in the classic cowboy roper world. And so hanging out with Amanda, horses had feelings, they fought, they responded. Like she said, if we were having a bad day, if you were paying attention, your horse was telling you that. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that that Amanda picked up on that because a lot of us kids grew up that horses were a job. I mean, they were a J-O-B, right? And they were a lot of work. You had to get up dang early morning to to chores done and you know buckets filled and and all that so I kind of get that that notion that a lot of kids do leave horses possibly because it's easier frankly to do other things I guess but that that does um it does belie the fact that they have those qualities that we didn't always see as kids so Amanda how did you how did you notice that first and not feel you're going to get into a job with Christopher again, you know? <laughs> you right? know, because I think at this, at this point of my life, I was now in this self-discovery phase uh, and I was willing to do whatever it took. You know, if that was, if, if my work was taking care of the horse, you know, and the laborious chores that it takes to do that, I was willing to do it because she had a lot to teach me. And, um, and I was, I was hungry for it. And, um, I would, I would go out to the barn every day and almost sit there and go, okay, what do you need to teach me today? And, she, and my goodness, I think, you know, at the time she was a, a three and a half year old mare. Um, and here she was an amazing teacher. And so I think that's, that's what got me through. And, you know, honestly, the, the chores now as an adult, for me are, are, um, a lot of therapy, mm-hmm. <laughs> honestly, I know what you mean. the only time that, it's the only time that I have in my day to be still and do a mindless chore, but be alone with my thoughts and think through my day and think where I'm at if I'm grounded, you know, and then it's, it's interesting because if I'm grounded, my horse will come and stand, put her chin neck on my shoulder, you know, from, from behind. And, and I know she knows where I'm at when she checks in. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, they are. They're like biofeedback machines, aren't they? And they, <laughs> I'm putting it back in the machine category, but I mean, they do, they do know exactly, well, they're, you know, they just know our intent. And, and I love that you can read them like that too. Now tell us a little bit about how you've turned this spark, this idea into Raining Grace. It's just a phenomenally large program and has a lot of people. You're changing lives. <laughs> 
It is. It is. A, well, you know, I figured about 10 years ago, Christopher and I rescued a herd of feral horses out in our Sonoran desert that were not, they weren't wild horses. They were actually quarter horses that, that an, ranchers just kind of left out here. It used to be open grazing and, and they just kind of disappeared as, as, you know, houses were built. And as, as we brought this herd of horses in, which we were crazy at the time, you know, we were fairly fairly new horse people. And, you know, you take for granted that horses don't come halter broke. And so, so we managed in a two month period to bring in 67 feral horses, wow. adopt them out. And in the process of that, all of the neighborhood kids were coming out because they all had experience with these horses because these horses would be like sleeping in their front yard. I mean, right. they, they were everywhere. Wow. Um, and, you know, kids would come out and they'd have story after story after story about different horses and what their experience was. And these kids were so devastated that the horses were, were asked to get rounded wow. up and taken away um, because it was mm-hmm. a part of their life, their story. And the kids were out there helping me. And all of a sudden we had this common, the, the horse was our common ground. Like we had been friends forever and these kids started sharing with me some pretty um, tough stuff that they were going through. Mm-hmm. And I thought, what is it about these horses that's, that's allowing these kids to feel this comfortable around a stranger? And then, then, you know, compounded by the fact that, you know, I went to my teacher, my horse every day and said, what do you have to teach me today? You know, they just have this amazing way of making time stand still and be completely present in the moment, grounded with them where nothing else matters. And I knew what they did for me. And I was watching what they were doing with these kids. And I, I said to Christopher, I said, I think we need to to start a ranch where we're working with kids that are struggling and use rescued horses to do it because they have stories that the kids identify with. And that's, and that's that's how it started. That's beautiful. You know, Chris, you have redeemed yourself, absolutely, (laughs) (laughs) from anything you may have felt less than for. And uh, how how did how did you feel about the horses as Amanda was sort of modeling this for you? Did you did you catch on to that immediately, too, of what the kids were able to do being around the horses? Yeah. So Christopher 1.0. Yeah. Using the geek term. I love (laughs) it. Probably been. I'd have been pretty focused on myself, but in the, the Christopher 2.0, I was really trying to figure out if I wanted to be a leader in our family, I needed to be a good servant. So I, I had to pay attention to what Amanda's desires and where her heart was. And, you know, it's interesting as I was watching this unfold, I could see what she was seeing. And uh, I remember distinctively the, 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 at the very end of the, the, I say the precipice of the beginning, right? Amanda woke up in the middle of the night and said, I, I, I had a dream and God told me we should start a ranch and it should be called Raining Grace Ranch. And it was like this epiphany thing. And it was two o'clock in the morning. And what I had learned from my past was when my wife says she wants to do something, you need to get on board with it. And so that's what we did. And I just, I ran with it with both feet in. Yeah. So how many years later is it now since you started Raining Grace? 11 years. Wow. Okay, so you've passed that tipping point, and and how do people support you? What do you do to support such an amazing, huge program? Oh, my goodness. You know, we are supported by the average Joe person. You know, um, it's $100, $20. It's it's truly a community-driven nonprofit, and so we're 100% volunteer-based, and it's everyday people supporting this ranch every day off of donations, and it and it runs. We've probably, in the course of the 11 years that we've been in operation, we've probably had about 325 horses move through the ranch and find homes or stay. Or, you know, some horses we bring in as, as a rescue situation that are not really going to be suitable to go back out because of medical needs and so stay here until the end of life for them. So uh, currently, the ranch is home to 70 horses everything from draft horses, miniatures, and everything in between. And they're all utilized in the program. 
And, and you use the word family a lot on the website. And I love that because we can see the diversity in the photos, horses mm-hmm. of people of ages, everything is, is completely diverse. So how, how is that a, a lightning rod these days for you guys? Are people drawn to that to, to kind of pull together? Or is that something you have to work on all the time to keep people together? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I was raised in a, in a rancher family. So they were all dairy cattlemen. And, and so, you know, Sundays at grandma's was like everybody else's Thanksgiving, whole family gathered. <laughs> so we really wanted a feeling that when we were together, we were all, we were all united. And so the culture of the ranch is that everybody matters. Everybody has a purpose. And so because we fund in that way, I think people are hungry for connectivity. We're so t- disconnected today with technology. It really um, wedges us part, right? And so at the ranch, you're so present and you and everybody's part matters. You know, you're working with 12 and 1400 pound horses. If you're not all working as a team, you know, lots of stuff can happen. And so don't you, Amanda, don't you feel like that's one of the places where people really. Yeah. And I, you uh, know, and I think, I think it's, I think it's really cool. You know, uh, I would say a primary client of the ranch is foster kids. And so these are kids that have, are coming from broken homes that don't know what a family is. And right. because we grew up in, in a family, it's so important. But you know what's even cooler is for the kids to come out and see a herd of 70 horses operating as mm-hmm. a family. You know, they take care of each other, you know, the alpha. And then you've got, you know, they, they just, the way they take care of each other and they don't get their feelings hurt, but they're firm but fair. And, you know, there's all of these things uh, that we teach the kids and they can watch the horses do it. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I think, like Christopher said, people are hungry for grassroots, you know, what does it feel like to belong and to be held accountable with love? You know, too often it's easy to get out of stuff, you know, yeah. and that's not, our, I, I, I see our kids that are so used to quitting that it becomes part of who they are. And before they even start, they've already quitted because that, they know what that, that's their MO. Yeah. And at the ranch, they're not allowed to do that. They're, right. if they're going to come out here, they are, you know, they're a, a a very important integral piece, and there's other people relying on them. They, and we, a yeah, lot of that's great. We talk about that with the herd of horses. Mm-hmm. They they don't do well as a, a single out there, do they? Horses no, just they don't. don't do that. They don't, and they, and don't they take survive. care of each other, and they all have roles, and yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is. There's so many strong lessons growing up that you know we didn't even know as kids, right? We didn't always see all yeah. those lessons, but I'm sure our parents were just going like, mm-hmm, "The horses will teach them that one," <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, which is a great way to be. Well, we we want to we so um, appreciate that you're you're out there doing this, and I know you're not doing it for us, but we're um, we're appreciating from afar. But how do people? find you? Do you want to give your website, uh, phone number, something that people can? Yeah. So our web, our website is www.azrgr.org. And the phone number is 480-466-2154. And as you can imagine, because we're 100% volunteer based, 100% donor based, we are always looking for you know, many hands to make light work, whether that be on the volunteer side or the donation side. And then as well as kiddos that are, that need that leg up, that, that need to be put in, in the, become a herd member, you know, right. to be successful. So, so yeah, people are curious sure. about, you know, where to send their kid. <laughs> they can yeah, talk absolutely. to you, but I imagine you're mostly Arizona based. And that's what I was going to say about the website is A-Z-R-G-R is what? Arizona Raining Grace Ranch is where you're getting that in case somebody that's, didn't catch all right. the, the letters in it. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and and look at their site. Look at their beautiful community that you've created. I see lots of finish line fencing, which uh, Kim has probably helped <laughs> with that. <laughs> but yes. it's brilliant because yes. you've really carved out um, a beautiful place. And it's probably not at the highest price that you can pay for such a, um, you know, a it's very difficult these days for nonprofits to make that. And I'm hoping that people will support you after listening to this. I know I will. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Imagine if you could take Monty to the barn with you. Watch and learn as he addresses each challenge with your horse and answers your questions, too. 
You head to the arena and you work on each new lesson, knowing Monty's there to encourage you, all with violence-free, tried-and-true methods. After all, he's been helping train horse lovers all his life. With his online university, you could be like Kathy, a retired teacher who just bought her first horse. Recently, I went to a tax shop to look for a smaller halter. I'm 61, just purchased my 14 hands POA the day after my birthday, just a few weeks ago, after never having had a horse. And yes, that's crazy, but as a retired teacher who never had a hobby other than teaching, I decided to go for it. My hubby and I have taken lessons this past year, but I really longed for a relationship with a horse. Um, The only other experience I'd ever had was to ride a horse in Philly, Pennsylvania, my hometown, when I was 16, and I got bucked off. And that was it (laughs) until I was 61. Um, Well, the owner of this tax shop, um, this is Precious Lady, 84-year-old lady, gave me a copy of this magazine, Equine Monthly. And the article I read in it was Horses Are Biofeedback Beings. And it was just so interesting. I really felt like I just found a pot of gold when I read it because in it, it talked about Monty's online university and that I could have access to 575 videos for $10 a month. And before that, I was just searching YouTube for everything I could find. But truthfully, that's just a pain. Um, I love that the uni videos are concise and they're in order. Um, They have extra notes and a quiz. And I just can't thank you enough for the huge blessing of your online university really has changed my life and I will never be the same. Um, I've had my horse Jack now for seven weeks and thanks to the videos I've done join up with him and it really worked like a dream. Uh, I had to do it in an arena, but it still worked thanks to Monty's lessons and the cues and the hand signals. Um, The ability to watch the lessons over and over on demand is incredible. So I also want to thank you so very much for making the online university affordable for this retired teacher. Thank you so much for all that you do for everyone who really wants to love a horse. Kathy. Dr. Juliet M. Getty is an independent equine nutritionist with a wide U.S. and international following. Her research-based approach optimizes equine health by aligning physiology and instincts with correct feeding and nutrition practices. Dr. Getty's goal is to empower the horse person with the knowledge to provide the best nutrition for his or her horse's needs. Dr. Getty is the author of the comprehensive resource, Feed Your Horse Like a Horse, as well as seven topic-centered spotlights on equine nutrition series of booklets. She also offers an informative e-newsletter called Forage for Thought. Her website, GettyEquineNutrition.com, provides a world of useful information for the horse person. Well, welcome back, Dr. Juliet Getty. How are you? I'm doing fabulously, Debbie. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here, as always. Oh, it, it is so much fun to have you. And I understand that you're going to be traveling a little bit in the next few months, so we'll have to catch up with you when you get back. I'm glad to hear that you're getting a little exploration time in this weird year. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I need some downtime. I think most of us could use some. So it's important that we all take a little time to take care of ourselves. Yeah, it, it's sort of a perspective year, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's been quite a year for most of us. And so yeah. thank you. But um, I'm still going to be working a little bit while I'm away. I can't completely leave leave it alone, but but I will enjoy the going out west and the cool, crisp air. Be nice. Yeah. Where are you going? Oh, Wyoming, Grand Teton National Park. Beautiful area, beautiful area, and very agriculturally based. So that makes sense, too. You're getting out there. I hear there's more sheep in Wyoming than there are <laughs> people. Well, but, um, <laughs> when good. I used to live in Colorado, we used to have the, the sheep migration, and it would back up traffic for miles. It was really quite fun to watch. Cool. But um, I don't think we'll see. I never saw a sheep when I was there, but we see oh. moose and elk and bison and all kinds of beautiful wildlife. 
Oh, thank, thank you for that little postcard. That was, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all, we all want to get outside a little bit more. I know everybody's trying, but anyway, that's, that's why I love this idea that you had for, for this episode. We, we ha- have you on about quarterly or so. And so you are yeah. very, you're very seasonal for us. And uh, this subject you thought about was transitioning horses to winter feeding. And I like that idea. And we're, we're sitting here around the first part of November and, um, some of us, you know, in the warmer climes may have just been climbing into uh, a different feeding system than earlier in the year. But some of us might already be struggling a little bit to get our horses transitioned. So what do you say to that person who really wants to do it right? Well, of course, it, like you said, it depends on what part of the country you're in or what part of the world you're in. So, But if you are in an area where, for example, your horse is accustomed to having pasture, and now, you know, you need to switch your horse to eating predominantly hay. And pretty soon it'll be all hay because, you know, there'll be at least a foot or more of snow on the ground. Could be, yeah. Um, so you, you need to be aware that the the cecum, the fermentation vat of a horse has billions of microbes in it and they get accustomed to certain types of feedstuffs. Mm-hmm. So when you're switching... And most people are aware that if you were to switch feeds, you would do it gradually. And the same is true if you're going from pasture to hay. And the same is also true, let's say your horse is already on hay. A lot of horses are on hay Mm -hmm. year-round. And then let's say you're switching hay suppliers for some reason. So anytime you switch forages, then you need to take it gradually. And... Mm -hmm. You also need to consider adding a prebiotic to the mix just to give the bacteria that live in the in the hind gut an edge and mm-hmm. so that they can proliferate and be, you know, make your horse healthier. That's a great idea too. So you really do need to transition from one distri- one, you know, mix to another almost sure. any time. Horses are finicky that way, aren't they? Well, they can be, of course. Some horses like mine, you know, they, they'll eat anything. But then okay. there are other horses that, you know, really, really turn their nose up at anything that's different. And that can be so frustrating. So it's good to do it gradually. And if you're lucky enough to have hay that you enough enough of both kinds so that you can gradually transition over to a different type of hay, or certainly in the case of pasture, throwing some hay out on the pasture so the horse gets accustomed to that as well. So anything that you can do to do it slowly, to wean them in reverse, so to speak, is is a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's great. So yeah, throwing I've, I've done that, throw a few flakes out in the pasture and everything. What about those guys who kind of turn up their nose and go like, are you kidding me? I got a pasture here. What do, you, <laughs> what do I do with that? <laughs> Well, yeah, you don't want to waste your hay because they'll probably just use it, you know, to to enjoy themselves on. But um, I would I would uh, I would just keep trying. I would keep putting it out because eventually the pasture is going to become to where it's not as tasty. Mm -hmm. And when it starts growing and starts going dormant, then uh, the horse may find the hay to be a better choice. Well done. Okay, so so for procrastinators, don't do it order your hay early if you can at all, right? And then you start to feed a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and kind of blend it over, right? Am I getting that right? That's the ideal situation. Now, of course, you know, there are times you get a whole new batch of hay and you can't really do much of that. Mm. So if you're in that kind of a circumstance, then it's especially important to give your your horse a, a prebiotic, something that contains various types of fermentation products from various bacteria, that will feed the existing bacteria along with some yeast or yeast extract that will also help. I don't think you need to worry about being a, offering a probiotic. A probiotic is um, those are live organisms, but and that would not really be necessary. But a prebiotic, and most products contain a little bit of both, so it's okay if there is some. There are some probiotics in there, but what you're really looking for are prebiotics. Okay. All right. So, okay. So we're transitioning now. It's getting colder. Obviously the grass has stopped growing and maybe the horses are even inside now, but, um, how do we, how do we watch our horse's weight? How do we, you know, it starts to get cold. Some, some can lose 
their weight. And, you know, I guess maybe describe a little bit about what we're watching for, what's good flesh on a horse. And sure. um, yeah. Well, I mean, every horse is, is different. What's good flesh for one may, may not be sufficient for another. Like if you have a thoroughbred, a uh, a body condition score of about a four, 4.5 is usually fine, where is if you have a warm blood, then you're probably looking at a body condition score of somewhere between five and six. Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if your mare is pregnant, then it has to be yeah. at least a six, maybe even higher. So it's, 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 that's an individual thing. However, when the horse is struggling to maintain a normal body temperature, that burns a lot of calories. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you want to make sure that your horse is capable of keeping warm. Now, for the vast majority of horses that are not clipped, uh, they should grow a, a sufficient winter coat. And I am very much against blanketing horses that have adequate coats. So you let, the, let the coat do its job. And if you blanket the horse, you, you push the hair down and, the and, the, and it cannot keep the the horse uh, warm um keep in mind that you know just because we're cold when we go outside yeah. um the horse is already wearing a coat so we put on a coat but the horse doesn't need a second coat they already have one um so that's assuming that they have a good healthy coat but if your horse is clipped obviously the horse will need a blanket if your horse is um too thin or older um, then blankets may be worthwhile. Um, so I kind of uh, respect the horse owner's judgment on that, but try not to make the mistake of overheating the horse. Horses love the cold weather. They just, I mean, we've all seen it when it gets crisp and cold outside, the horses run around and buck and have a high old time and they just, they really enjoy it. So d don't uh, blanket them just because you're cold. Watch your horse, see how he behaves. If he starts to shiver, of course, and that's obviously a problem. If it's, if it's wet and it's raining, you don't want the skin to get wet. So you want to protect him against that if it's cold and wet. So it's a lot of common sense involved in it, but in general, a horse's coat should be sufficient. Yeah, good. Well, you know, God, God made him. He doesn't make mistakes. So <laughs> it does make a lot of sense when you think about it. But, but we all, we all, you know, I'm, I'm always cold. So you know, I, I look at a horse who's standing out in the rain, thinking he has every opportunity to get out of the rain, and look right. at him. <laughs> they enjoy it. I, I know they enjoy it. It's just yeah. hard for me to, you know, put myself in that position. So that's right. all. Yeah, we get it. We get it. But um, yeah. So if we, if we have done our job right. You told me a stat just now, a few minutes ago, that is really comforting, fr frankly, What's that that? you've never had one of your horses colic. And I, I think I prefaced it by saying, oh, everybody's a little familiar with colic, right? And you said, no, not necessarily. And I think that's yeah. encouraging. Well, so tell us. I think most of us are familiar with it, but whether or not it's your horse that's experiencing it, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to be the case. But Horses can colic for all kinds of different reasons, but generally if the digestive tract is well taken care of um, and they're adequately hydrated, uh, we're not going to see a lot of a lot of colic cases. Um, in the winter time, however, the most common cause of colic is dehydration. Mm -hmm. And the best way to protect your horse from that, if you live in an area that gets you know, below freezing is to make sure that the water uh, supply is heated generally to about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit because horses uh, won't drink water adequately if it's ice cold. Mm -hmm. So if you, you, have, you have a situation where you have to go out early in the morning and crack the ice off, off the water trough, mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a potentially uh, dangerous situation because the horse has been without water all night. So mm -hmm. you need to um, find a way to either have an automatic watering system, something that has running water that doesn't freeze, or what I always used to do is uh, buy these big 16-gallon uh, water tubs that had um, heating elements inside the plastic so they weren't exposed. And that allowed my horses to always have uh, enough water to drink. Mm, that's a great idea. Yeah, to, to have the the electricity. I mean, it's, it's hard for us to imagine how much... Um, 
they don't really, they don't want to crack the eye. They don't want to get through their, as thirsty as they might be. And no, they won't just get enough water from the snow on the ground. And <laughs> True. There's a lot of things people kind of assume. And it's probably one of the more deadly ways to, to handle your horse. Unfortunately, some people do think they get enough water from snow. And I found that out the hard way when I lived in Colorado when we lost our electricity and our mm. water pump was not working. And so I had to go outside and fill a big 10 gallon vat with snow and uh, heat it inside the house for water. And so 10 gallons of snow only gave me one gallon of water. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I didn't even know the ratio, but I knew it wasn't very much. <laughs> It's really yes. fast, yeah. So, so yeah, horses don't uh, get enough water from snow. And, and then in order to encourage them to drink, because if the water is cold, let's say you have a, an automatic waterer and the water is ice cold, but mm-hmm. it's not frozen, it, they, they may not drink sufficient amounts because of the temperature. So it's important that they have uh, salt. Mm-hmm. And salt is important year-round. Um, all all full-sized horses need two tablespoons of salt per day all the time, regardless mm-hmm. of the climate. Um, they need more in the summer when they're mm-hmm. sweating. and then But during the winter, two tablespoons a day. Usually I like to divide that up in between meals because – more than one tablespoon at a time can be a little too salty for them. Yeah. But um, that will encourage them to drink. So make sure if you're giving your horse salt that they have water close by and that it's mm. always, always available. Mm. Yeah. And do you put anything in your water to to change the taste when uh, for any reason at all? Traveling maybe? Um, no. Oh, when I was when traveling? Yes, I would do that. Um when, when traveling, that's always an issue. In fact, I would start my horses to get used to water that's flavored with some unsweetened apple juice just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that way I took some apple juice with me on the road and I could just add it to the potable water that I got elsewhere mm-hmm. and, and they drank just fine while on the road. Good, sure. good. Okay, so colic is that that word that people get a little afraid of. And for, for new horse owners or people who haven't put a plan together, what what should people do if they find themselves in a situation, even if it's the the horse in the stall next door at the equestrian center, if they feel like they're in a colicking situation, what's the first thing they should do? Well, if you think that your horse is colicking, the first thing you do is you call your vet. I mean, that's right. very important because colic can be something that the horse can can get over or it can be a medical emergency that requires surgery. So you really don't know what the situation is. So call your vet and don't force the horse to walk, but try not to let him, you know, thrash around. It's best to to let him just be calm. Okay. So that's that's a, more of a medical emergency than anything else. Good. Okay. So, but sometimes people thing, wait a long time. Yes. Do, no, you yeah. don't want to wait around. If, if the horse has um, some type of torsion or uh, impaction, this can be you know, very dangerous. So, um, I, I wouldn't fool with colic. One thing that I find that a lot of horses, another reason that horses develop colic during the winter is when they transition to hay is because they, they tend to eat their hay too quickly. They eat it all, whatever's in sight, and then they eat it too quickly and and think about the, the moisture level in hay typically is about six or 7%. Whereas, the pasture moisture is a 50% or more. Mm -hmm. So you're going from a moist feed to a a very, very dry one. And if it's eaten too quickly, there can be impactions. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, though, if a horse has forage all the time, like I'm always, always promoting, then they will calm down and they won't eat so quickly. So it's one of the main reasons horses colic on hay is because they only get hay intermittently throughout the day and they go for many hours without anything to eat so that when they get their hay, they eat it Mm. all up and they just basically inhale it. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind when when transitioning to hay, to fit correctly. If your horses are used to being on pasture and they're on there all the time, they they need to be able to graze in the same manner with free choice. Hay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's a really good point that people should, if you can go to the website, horsemanshipradio.com and just 
do a search for Getty and look back on all those things that Juliet's told us uh, about forage and keeping that horse maintaining something in his system as much as possible. I think you'll understand even deeper her conviction for that last point you just made. <laughs> so thank, thank I tend to bring that. it up quite a lot because it, well, it's good. it applies yeah. to everything else. And and there's one other thing that I'd like to to say about during the winter, instead of just locking them in a stall, I would I would recommend, if at all possible, to give your horse the choice of being in a stall or not. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you're lucky enough to have a situation where you can open up the stall doors and they can walk in or out at will, that would be the ideal circumstance so that they can choose, do they want to be in shelter or do they not? Most of the time you'll find that they don't, just like you've seen them stand out in the rain, you know? (laughs) So that's a real important thing because horses that are stalled for long periods of time can have all kinds of health issues. And so I like to, to allow them to have more free time, freedom, even in the cold weather. Yeah. And I think for the rest of the population called humans, we think that's ideal too, because then we can say, well, they have their choice. And so we gave them a choice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they're standing outside, but <laughs> that we feel better knowing that you know, it was their choice. So yeah. Thank you, Dr. Getty. I appreciate it. And I love it that you're transitioning into your winter with a little trip up north and enjoy your time in Wyoming. We'll be thinking of you and can't wait for the inspiration that you bring back to us on Horsemanship Radio. Thank you so much. I'm hoping it'll snow. I haven't seen snow in a few years, so maybe. Oh, I will hope for white stuff for you then. Good. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm excited to introduce you to Coro, my new online shopping destination where I can find all my favorite horse care products for the best prices, and they're shipped directly to my barn door. Coro was created for the horse owner and horse care professional whose hard work and dedication goes into caring for their horses to make it even easier with industry expertise. They have tried and tested products, and they even have horse-inspired storytelling all under one roof. They offer for auto ship so that you can never run out of your go-to supplements, your grooming products, your fly sprays, your horse cookies, and more. Where you set the frequency of how often you receive items, as well as you can unlock additional savings they have up there. They even offer an afterpay, which I like, which then splits your payments into four payable every two weeks. It's great. Coro has something for everyone, no matter what breed of horse you have or what their job might be. They care about the way you care about your horse, which is why they have tons of content on their blog. It's what makes them different. Coro Stories, and they created a community on their social platforms to help educate and entertain and even inspire horsemen and horsewomen alike. Owning a horse can be expensive. Caring for them shouldn't be. Check out their website today at coroshop.com. That's C-O-R-R-O-S-H-O-P.com. And use the code HORSEMANSHIP10 for 10% off your first order today. This is all for the love of your horse, Coro. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of... Dear Monty, I'm a new horse owner and I have a 20-month-old colt I've never done a join-up with. He's already pretty connected to me. Would it benefit me to do one and should I wait until he's a little older? Monty's answer. Dear Kevin... My book, From My Hands to Yours, has a section on what I recommend regarding when and how much to do in the area of join-up. If you read that, you will realize that you are already well past the point where I would have done my first join-up with them. It is my position that join-up done properly will always be beneficial. 20 months is a prime time to be sure that the horse is familiar with the partnership with human beings. I recommend the first is shortly after weaning. By 20 months, I would be doing two to three join-ups within a week's time. Get busy, and I think you'll find it beneficial. Monty. 
For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. And November 6th through 8th, coming right up, we have an intro course, Module 4, and that's preparing for the intro exams. So for those people who have taken the others, they're ready. And then on the November 12th, 10 through 12th, we have an introductory course, Module 1, for those that are starting the next pace. And that's for up to Monty's methods. And then November 13 through 15, we've got horses and healing again for our veterans and first responders, first responders. And then November 17 through 19, we've got the introductory course module two, that's join up and everything that entails in learning how to get up to a join up and then the process of follow up after that. And then November 20 through 22, we have the introductory course module three. See, we're coming full circle there. And that one is all about long lining and groundwork. So then we are into December. In December 1 through 3, we have the introductory course, Module 4, preparing for the intro exams. And then December 4 through 6, we have our last of the year, Horse Sense and Healing for veterans and first responders. And then February 8th, it's taking a leap into the future here, February 8th through 12th, we have our Monty Special Training. And uh, we're really excited about that because we're going to be using our transition horses in that. Oh, neat. Great. Yeah. And for all of that and more... Go to MontyRoberts.com. That's the official website for Monty Roberts and everything Monty Roberts. It's all there in one place, and it's brand new and sparkling and easy to navigate and beautiful. Thank you. Or if you want to go old school and give them a call on the phone, you can do that. It's 805-688-6288, and you will be greeted by a happy, friendly, knowledgeable human being (laughs) who will help you with everything you need. And by the way... You're driving down the road, listening listening to this podcast, and you could not jot down that number, 805-688-6288. You could go to MontyRoberts.com, and the phone number's there, too. It is. <laughs> <laughs> we give you a cheat sheet. There go it is. full circle there. <laughs> and for details about today's show, you're going to go to HorsemanshipRadio.com. This is episode 170. And you're going to find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. We love your feedback. Please follow Monty Roberts on Facebook. The page is Monty Roberts. Look for the one with the little blue check mark. And Monty is also on other social media platforms, Twitter and Instagram. His handle is Monty underscore Roberts. And if that's not enough, go get the app and help your friends get the app. We have a native app for Horse Radio Network. It has all the shows on it. So you can press the all shows button and then you subscribe to all all the shows. They come right to your phone. Or you can pick and choose which ones you want. We have between 14 and 17 shows going at one given moment or all, all the time. And the app does work with both iPhone and Android. If you don't know how to get to your app store and download an app, find a nine-year-old and they'll do it for you. <laughs> True. <laughs> and they'll even show you how to use it and yes, everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I love it when you admonish us to tell our friends how to use it once we've learned, like we really know something. But it's so easy, you guys. It's so easy. Downloading is the hardest part, if that tells you something. But I I love it, too. It satisfies the need to do the check mark thing. I don't know about you, but I'm a check mark person. I like to check things off my list. And, you know, every time you've listened all the way through to a, an episode, it does a satisfying little check after that so you know which ones you've listened to and which ones you need to so I have so much fun with that anyway is that OCD I'm not sure but many th- <laughs> many thanks to our sponsors too we couldn't do this without them that's finish line fencing and all the great folks there thanks Kim and also MontyRobertsUniversity.com I love our team thanks Janine and Julia and Monty and you know I just hope that everybody every time I say this I really want people to do this. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network because you're going to become addicted to these podcasts that are all about horses. And that is at www.horseradionetwork.com. Jen and Glenn and all the team have provided such a great platform. So until next time, I mean this, have many happy horse hours. (laughs) 